Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to the session on the Hindu Kush Himalaya Call to Action, Maintaining the Pulse of the Planet. Thank you all for giving us your time to join this session. My name is Vinay Pasakala, and I'm representing International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, popularly known as ISIMOD. It is a pleasure to be your host today, and I very much look forward for, to our discussion. Our session is produced by the JLF technical team, along with my ISIMOD colleagues, Dr. Srijana Josi, Saeed Mohammed Abu Bakr, Susmita Kumar, Indu Chitrakar, and Rez Rasbandari. I would like to request all our speakers to keep their videos on, but to turn off their mics except when speaking. Our session participants may type their questions to any of our speakers on the Whova Q&A box to the right of your screen. Please do state your name and affiliation before typing your question. Also, please do mention the name of the speaker if you have question, if your question is addressed to a particular speaker as far as possible, and please be short and clear. Now, we would like to begin our session with, uh, with an icebreaker. First, we would like to quiz you on your general knowledge on mountains. For this, we will require you to answer our questions on Slido. Hence, please visit the website slido.com or use the QR code as shown in the screen. You will need to type the event code as GLF Biodiversity and then select Isimode from the room. Our first question is, what percent of the Earth's land surface is covered by mountains? Your choices are 5%, 10%, 22%, and 48%. I would request our participants to please vote. Okay, we have a 75% of our participants saying it's 22%. We have other 24% part, 24 saying 10% and 48%. Okay, still the majority says it's 22%. We have increasing numbers saying 10%. Thank you all who have answered this question. The correct answer is 22%. Next, we would like to know you, our session participants, a little better. So our next question is, please write the name of the country where you have come from. Okay, we have most of the participants coming from Nepal. Namaste. We have from Bhutan. Most of our participants are from, still from Nepal, from Asian countries. It's nice to see that we have participants from Europe, Okay, all the way from Canada, Switzerland, Peru. We have one representative from South America. Thank you all who have participated here. It's nice to know that we are from different uh, continents here. And finally, we would like to know which sector do you represent? Please choose from among the choices. May I please request our participants to respond? Okay, we have a result here. So we have most of our participants belonging to academia and research. We do have a representation from intergovernmental organizations. It's 
it's nice to see that a lot of researchers and academicians have interest in our work. And there is a, quite a, a number of representation from civil society, private sector, government as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for participating in this icebreaker activity. Please keep, do keep the Slido tab on standby in your laptop or any other devices that you are using, as we will be engaging you again later on our session. And now we will formally begin our session. I would like to invite our Dr. Uh, Director General Dr. Pema Ganzu for his welcome remarks. Over to you, Dr. Pema. Uh, may I request Dr. Pema to unmute himself? Okay, seems like we are having a technical problem here. So we will get back to Dr. Pema later. So uh, sorry, for, uh, apologies for the technical problem, <laughs> dear participants. So uh, now I would like to take you all to next three and a half minutes journey. We would like to, uh, where we are going to show you about the Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Please enjoy this short journey with us.
Uh, thank you, thank you. Hope you all enjoyed this short uh, visual journey to our reason. We will be putting the wave link of this video on the Huba chat. So please uh, visit the website again to watch this movie. Uh, once again, I would like to try with Dr. Pema Ganto if he is available to, uh, he's able to get connected. Uh, Dr. Pema? Okay, sorry, we are not able to get uh, Dr. Pema yet again. So we will again uh, keep trying later on. So now I would like to move on with our keynote speaker, Dr. Ekla Sharma, Deputy Director General here at ISIMOD. Uh, Dr. Sharma's presentation will introduce the Hindu Kush Himalaya and highlight its significance and present the HKH call to action to protect the, uh, to protect the pearls of the planet. Uh, over to you, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, uh, Vinay. Very good afternoon from Kathmandu. Dr. Pema Gamso, Director General of ISIMOD, all the panelists from our regional member countries, ISIMOD colleagues, the participants uh, who are attending from all over the world. So thank you very much uh, for attending this session. I'm going to talk about the HKH, the Hindu Kush Himalaya call to action and resilient recovery from the COVID-19. If you look at uh, this slide from the space, you can see uh, the Hindu Kush Himalayan region uh, uh, from uh, the Hindu Kush mountains to Karakoram, Pami, the Tibetan plateau, the Himalayas, and you can see uh, up to uh, Yunnan and Northern Myanmar. It's a beautiful area. And this is the most prominent uh, area in the world uh, as you look from the space uh, as was uh, mentioned by one of the astronauts uh, who visited Isimor. It's a global asset for food, energy, water, carbon, and cultural and biological diversity is very, very rich. And that is why this is also called as a global asset. This is also the pulse of the planet. If something happens here, then the whole planet actually feels it. it the mountains are hotspots of climate change, and then uh, we really see uh, this mountain region is very, very important. So now let me show you the mountain region is the darker blue uh, part of this slide. And you can see Afghanistan, Pakistan, uh, India, Nepal, China, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar share this Hindu Kush Himalayan mountain region. 10 major rivers originate from the mountains here. 240 million people live in the mountains and 1.9 billion people are in the mountains and downstream. So this is a huge, um, uh, highly populated area. And from this slide, you can see on, in terms of biodiversity, there are 36 global biodiversity hotspots. Out of that, four are actually located in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region some portions of mountains of Central uh, Asia, the entire, uh, the Himalaya, then some parts of mountains of Southwest China and some parts of Indo-Burma. This region, this uh, region is very rich in, uh, um, uh, we have high uh, endivism. And then uh, we also have um, um, uh, uh, lots of hotspots huh? uh, within this uh, larger uh, global hotspots. So, we have also seen in the Eastern Himalayan region that three global hotspots are meeting. And this is still unexplored area. From 1998 to 2008, um, uh, about 350 species in 10 years were discovered. This clearly shows that still uh, we need to do uh, science here. And biodiversity is uh, so important globally it is something which can sustain life uh, and uh, which can give uh, the systems stability. If you look at this slide, the darker uh, red uh, part are the population um, density, uh, as you can see, it's the cities and large urban areas are in the uh, downstreams of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. And uh, much of the decisions are made in the uh, highly populated area like Delhi, Beijing, Islamabad, or uh, it is in Dhaka. 
uh, or NAPITO. So uh, I think the mountain specific policies, mountain specific approach uh, needs to come. So we need to really see that how mountains provide benefits to the downstream and to the global goods and services so that, uh, that uh, the, our policymakers uh, in our eight countries are also then uh, trying to uh, give more importance to uh, this. Recently, there was a ministerial summit um, who um, have actually signed a declaration. I'll come to that. So the whole attention of the governments of these eight countries needs to be um, brought to the mountains of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. We also know this region is uh, very rich in biodiversity, but uh, also very rich in human societal diversity. More than 1,000 living languages are found here. The uh, related traditional knowledge systems uh, are so important. So in the context of uh, the future sustainable development, traditional knowledge, and the societal uh, asset that we have in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region for resilience building, I think this is uh, enormous, another asset. Uh, global asset that we see uh, here. Out of 1,000, nearly 70% of uh, the languages uh, are already threatened. That means we need to put efforts in this region. So what happens here in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region directly impacts one fourth of humanity. But the food produced uh, in the uh, basins, uh, which I uh, showed you earlier, caters to three to four billion people. That means almost half of humanity. So that is a uh, very important uh, um, data to remember that the Hindu Kush Himalayan region actually caters to uh, almost uh, half in, uh, um, uh, humanity in this uh, planet. So Isimod uh, for five years had done the assessment, uh, which is called Hindu Kush Himalaya assessment for the first time, most comprehensive assessment for the entire uh, region. And this was um, published by Springer Nature. It's open access and was uh, released uh, last year in February. And uh, this um, assessment uh, actually is uh, uh, the evidence that we were able to bring and go to the countries for developing the HK's call to action. So some of the findings of this um, uh, assessment, the poverty, uh, the mountains are more poorer uh, than the plain areas. One third of the population uh, in mountains are uh, poor, whereas average uh, poverty in our eight countries are one fourth. So this means clearly mountains are poorer. But we have also done multidimensional poverty analysis of our eight countries. And you can clearly see the mountains are much more uh, poorer. So when I say multidimensional uh, poverty, then um, many other things like energy poverty, uh, other poverty also come in, not only the economic uh, poverty. So for mountains, we have very mountain specificities and we need to really look into that. So the call is that uh, our governments and our regions should really focus on uh, reducing the multidimensional poverty and not just the economic poverty. We have also seen uh, in the assessment that food insecurity is uh, quite glaring here. 30% of the population in the mountains uh, suffer from uh, food insecurity. And then uh, about 50% of the people are malnourished. And we see, if we look at the children below 5%, that is one fifth of the half of the children are uh, stunted. So that means our youth are already affected. So we need to really invest. This is uh, where uh, we can bring um, the uh, change uh, so that there is a transformative change in this region. The energy poverty is also important. And the clean energy, like the hydro potential, is about 500 gigawatt. That is 500,000 megawatt. It's a huge uh, energy potential, and half a billion homes uh, can be actually lighted uh, um, uh, or uh, energy uh, can be used by this. So it's a huge potential not yet developed fully. 80% of our rural population uh, still lack uh, the access to clean energy for cooking. So this is uh, another area where we need to really put effort because lots of people uh, depend on forest from rainland, other biodiversity uh, products uh, for the energy needs. So by, for biomass, so high out migration is also quite uh, 
uh, uh, glaring in this region and we see uh, lots of people migrate outside and uh, the remittance which comes from uh, this migration can be used for sustainable development uh, very much. Um, so that is uh, very important, uh, I think, one of the economic activity that people have. Um, then I will come to the uh, COVID later on, but migration is something which has uh, suffered a lot after the COVID um, uh, impact. So biodiversity loss, around 70 to 80 percent of our original habitat had been already lost from this region relative to uh, 1500, uh, 15th century. Then about 60 to 85 percent of our rural popul population are dependent on biodiversity for their subsistence. Then when we look at gender, the poverty, both income and energy and other forms of poverty, food insecurity and migration actually affect women, children and marginalized communities more than uh, the others. So this is uh, quite important. And then the policies and responses of our HKS countries uh, actually overlook this multiple forms of exclusion. So we really need to work uh, on uh, this. Another big driver of change that we see in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region is 1.5 degree, um, uh, which uh, the Paris agreed. It is already too hot for us. So if it is 1.5 degree, then it is uh, more than two degree uh, average for this region. And with the current emission, uh, it will be uh, more than five degrees centigrade rise by the end of uh, this century. So this means I think uh, this region is going to suffer very much. The problem uh, is that the people living in the Hindu Kush Himalayan uh, region, they are carbon neutral or carbon negative. They are not the contributors to the global uh, warming or the global climate change. Uh, they are the ones who are the victims. So we suddenly need to see that uh, the adaptation and resilience and the investment has to come to the mountain uh, region of this region. One of the indicators of climate change is that if there is a 1.5 degree world, um, then we are going to lose one third of glaciers by 2100. And with the current emission, two thirds of the glaciers are going to be lost. And then uh, related other cryospheric uh, changes are also quite critical. So this is a quite evident um, indicator of climate change, but uh, there are many uh, livelihoods and um, and development issues downstream uh, in uh, the uh, river basins that uh, we see climate change has impacted uh, in landscapes and river basins. Disaster risk is increasing very much, floods, droughts, landslides, uh, uh, glacial lake outbursts, floods, we see quite often, and you can see this big uh, round circles on uh, the centers where we have uh, these um, uh, disasters. And there are many different types. More than 1 billion people are at risk of uh, natural uh, hazards in this region. And if you look at the graph on the right-hand side, you can see uh, from 1980 uh, till 2010, and period of 10 uh, from 2000 to 2010, you can see economic loss is quite uh, significant. That is the orange one. And the yellow is the people who are affected. You can see quite significant. Everything is increasing in recent years. The people killed, the blue collars, so many people are killed. And the number of events also have increased. So disaster is one big uh, um, uh, aspect of our um, development that needs to be addressed. Air pollution and black carbon uh, in the region are also uh, quite important. It is uh, uh, it has to be a regional issue that uh, needs to be addressed nationally, locally. And then uh, we see lots of pollutants uh, which are uh, originating in nearby areas, amplified um, uh, the climate change uh, in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, temperature uh, rise is accelerated. Uh, then we also see melting of glaciers and snow uh, because of black carbon uh, deposition. Then uh, circulation of monsoon uh, and distribution of rainfall over Asia is also affected uh, because of uh, this air pollution. And the Himalaya region is one of the uh, very important uh, regulator of monsoons and negatively um, impact also on human health and the crop production production during winter season is quite uh, evident from this region. So uh, those were some of the results of the assessment. And then 
based on those uh, assessment result we went to the countries and we co developed the hks call to action um, uh, to sustain mountain environments and improve livelihoods in the indo kashmalan region so all the eight countries for the last one year we had been actually uh, co developing this document and recently this document uh, is released uh, was released on 15th of october so meanwhile while this uh, uh, document was being developed uh, early this year we faced the problem of covid 19 and we came up with a policy uh, paper uh, called covid 19 impact and policy responses which talks about uh, uh, the uh, issues this Hindu Kush Himalayan region is facing as an impact from COVID and what are the policy responses, needs for regional cooperation and international support. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, both the HK's call to action and the COVID-19 uh, related actions that we need to do. So for the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, after the assessment, we were preparing our uh, work for a prosperous HK's region, as you see, on the right hand side the, and uh, we wanted to really move uh, with that um, uh, uh, prosperous pathway but if we just muddle through and do the business as usual then we would not reach our prosperity the countries might start uh, having problems and degradation of ecosystems uh, ecosystem services goods and services of, from this region production water everything is going to be affected and if we don't um, uh, work together, but uh, we simply fight, then I think downhill, which will really uh, make this region unsustainable. The path for uh, achieving the prosperity, I think a large scale investment uh, with regional cooperation is very important, but bottom up approach you know, in terms of its uh, investment from local and national cooperation is equally important. So both of these pathways are uh, important for cooperation and co uh, coordination to reach the um, prosperous uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan region. Now we know enough. That's why we are saying call to action. But while uh, we are start working for action, we would also work uh, for better data, knowledge, communication, cooperation. That will uh, mean better action in future as things change. So we will simultaneously do good research and good knowledge development while the action is on. The vision of the uh, Hindu Kush Himalaya call to action is to have a prosperous, peaceful and poverty free mountain people. And we would really like to see uh, this region is food, energy, mountain and water secured. And uh, we would like to see climate and disaster resilience uh, and mountain people uh, of this region and the entire world is uh, going towards resilience. So the six urgent actions uh, that we have uh, actually developed uh, in the HK's call to action are quite important and critical. Cooperate at all the uh, levels across the Hindu Kush Himalayan region for sustainable development and mutual benefits. And here we can really see actions at national, regional, and international scales and how to sustain this global asset. Then building the momentum for robust cooperation and investment in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. We would really like to nurture the strengths of people to people, business to business, government to government cooperation. And we need to build a trust among the countries to cooperate for climate action and for uh, sustainable uh, development. And then, of course, promoting science policy forum and regional cooperation uh, very much uh, in this uh, uh, call, uh, action uh, number one. Action number two on the right hand side is to recognize and prioritize the uniqueness of the Hindu Kush uh, um, mountain people. And here we would like to see collectively uh, the Hindu Kush uh, mountain, uh, uh, Hindu Kush Himalaya mountain agenda is uh, developed, defined with stakeholders. We need to really strengthen national, regional, and global voice for the Hindu Kush Himalayan region and its people and promote gender equity and inclusive development uh, because that is one of the pillars of development um, in the mountains uh, very much that needs to be addressed and then support diversity of the Hindu Kush Himalayan people's culture. We have very rich cultures here and then we are saying HK is calling uh, 
uh, on cooperation for mountain solutions uh, very much. And then, uh, of course, finally uh, promote mountain champions, networks and alliances uh, very much. This region's alliance with other mountain regions of the world also. The third uh, very important action is to take a concerted ac climate action to all levels to keep the global warming below two degree as agreed in Paris, but we would say 1.5 degree by 2100. Right? So suddenly, and here the actions, uh, the targets are global recognition of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region as hotspot of climate change and sustainable development. As I said, mountains are hotspots. I think that needs to be recognized and more actions to uh, come here. Efforts for regional adaptation, um, our region is more for adaptation. Mitigation is very limited. And then global mitigation is very important. But countries, big countries like India and China, there are uh, plain areas where mitigation needs to happen. And that can uh, also uh, help uh, in uh, putting this 1.5 degree down. Then uh, mitigation of air pollution, which I already mentioned, is quite important at regional, national, and local levels. So we need to reduce biomass burning, but uh, promote clean energy. And then carbon neutral societies, uh, we need to provide opportunities and incentives for the mountain people who are either negative or carbon neutral. Then north-south uh, cooperation as well as south-south cooperation for climate action in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. The fourth um, uh, action uh, is um, the, uh, to uh, take accelerated actions to achieve the SDGs uh, and nine mountain uh, priorities. And uh, nine mountain uh, priorities have been identified in the assessment report, which I presented. That needs to, that is consistent with the uh, sustainable development goals. And we would really like to support our regional member countries, eight countries on SDG actions and then uh, reporting. Then uh, we would like to ensure uh, regional member countries to use multidimensional poverty measures to address SDGs. And then of course, mountain specific policies are required. Um, then uh, that is quite uh, important and then Certainly, we'd like to promote uh, adaptation to climate change as top priority cross-cutting issues amongst the uh, SDGs in the region. Then the fifth is uh, enhancing ecosystem resilience and how to halt biodiversity loss and land degradation is the uh, action. And here, I think we should provide incentives uh, for the Mount, uh, Hindu Kush Himalayan mountain people for uh, conservation and their action for managing the ecosystems. And we need to really see our uh, ecosystems are managed sustainably, like the forests, rangelands, wetlands, agricultural land, and many different forms of land uses for improving livelihoods of the people, but also for global goods and services. And transboundary cooperation, both at the landscape level and river basins are quite critical and important uh, in this action. And then biodiversity inform, uh, information system needs to be developed for the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, where use of biodiversity for um, uh, the benefit of the people while the resources are uh, conserved. I think this is the approach we would like to say. And then the life support, biodiversity is the life support uh, for the Hindu Kush Himalayan region and the planet itself. So that uh, needs to be looked into. Finally, the um, regional data and information sharing and science and knowledge cooperation uh, is the action identified. And here, we would like to fill the data gaps and develop actionable knowledge ba base. It's not just the knowledge, but actionable. And cooperation on data generation methodologies and uh, sharing across the region and outside is quite critical and important. And we need to promote and use ECMOD's regional database uh, system uh, for the region. Another big uh, impact that uh, disruption, which we uh, saw recently, as I mentioned, is uh, uh, COVID-19 and how we can have a resilient recovery. In this uh, policy paper, we have looked into impacts, risks and vulnerabilities and actions, short term, medium term and long term and policy uh, responses also. And we have looked into economic dimension, food and uh, security, nutrition related issues, social uh, issues, uh, gender 
issues, environmental dimension, climate action and resilience, policy responses, and elements of regional cooperation under this very uh, difficult time. And then, of course, what international cooperation. However, we have not looked uh, into public health uh, in this paper, um, as there are many institutions and um, World Health Organization looking into this. So what we have done, we have tried to use both the SKS call to action and then a resilient uh, recovery uh, from um, COVID-19 and uh, went to different countries. And recently on 15th October, we had the Hindu Kushimala Ministerial Mountain Summit. Uh, and you can see ministers from uh, all our countries uh, uh, actually uh, making the statements. And uh, then very interestingly, we also see UK government uh, ministers uh, uh, inviting and making a roadmap for COP, um, uh, which is going to happen in uh, Glasgow uh, very soon uh, next year. So how this region, the mountains can be focused in that. So this ministerial summit actually signed the uh, declaration um, uh, on the SKS call to action. So all the eight countries and both the call to action as well as COVID resilience develop uh, are included here. And this uh, declaration uh, is uh, very much looking for the um, action as well as resilient recovery through regional cooperation. And we are also seeking international support. And in this Global Landscape Forum, uh, we'd like to say that I think let's all of us join hand for the support of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, which is the pulse of the planet and the global asset. One of the very specific element of this future action is transboundary landscape, which is uh, the global um, landscape forum uh, would like to hear. And we have actually identified six transboundary landscape where uh, four of them, we are very active, Hindu Kush Karakoram, Pamir landscape, uh, which is uh, far west between uh, Afghanistan, China, Pakistan, and um, Tajikistan, where the cooperation is uh, really uh, enhancing. And then uh, um, second one is uh, Kailas, which is between China, uh, India, and Nepal. Third, uh, number three is um, uh, Mount Everest uh, between Nepal and uh, China. Then we have uh, the fourth one is Kanchanjunga landscape, which is actually shared by Bhutan, uh, India, and uh, Nepal. And then the fifth one is uh, Far Eastern Himalayan landscape, which is shared by China. Uh, Yunnan, uh, Northern Myanmar, and Northeast India. Uh, of course, the sixth uh, um, uh, transboundary landscape is not yet uh, in operation. We are also working on um, the uh, reducing emissions uh, from deforestation and forest uh, degradation and trying to really see landscapes, um, uh, RED, um, uh, red plus, and river basins, how all these can contribute uh, to the sustainable development in this region. The last slide to show um, here is that when we are talking about landscape, uh, you can see this uh, particular very small landscape is totally degraded in 1987. So there was a uh, in Nepal and the government of Nepal uh, made a policy decision to make a devolution and hand over forest to communities to manage. And then the researchers, institutions like ISIMOD uh, and many other organizations, development, everybody worked, the people worked together and then all of uh, the people's joint collaborative action changed this 1987 uh, in about 20 years time. That particular landscape has turned green, diverse. It looks like a living landscape. I think I would like to show you once again, such a degraded place you can see in 15, 20 years. So with this slide, I would like to say, let's make this world a global landscape, a living landscape, a landscape as green as this, a landscape with uh, lots of biodiversity to sustain life in this uh, um, uh, planet. So with this, thank you very much. And uh, uh, wish you all uh, a very um, uh, interactive session. So thank you very much. Uh -huh. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. That was a quite an enlightening presentation. Uh, now, if, you if our session participants have any question related to Dr. Sharma's presentation, please include them in the Q&A box to the right of your screen. These will be addressed during the Q&A session that will follow the panel discussion. 
Now, uh, I would like to invite our participants again, once again, to the slido.com, where we are going to put up another question. The question is, what comes to your mind when you think of the HKH? So what comes to your mind when you think of the Hindu Kush Himalaya? Okay, we have the mountains, biocultural diversity, yes. We do have more than thousand languages. Transboundary resource, very much. That's what we are working on. Water tower of the Asia, yes. As Dr. Sharma presented, 10 Asian rivers uh, are originate from the region. Melting glaciers, yes. Even if we meet the Paris Agreement, one third of our glaciers will be gone by 2100. Bicultural diversity, yes. Thank you, thank you all. Now, before moving on to our panel discussion, once again, I would like to invite uh, Director General, Dr. Pema Ganzo for his remarks. Over to you, Dr. Chu. All right, you Hello, uh, can you hear me? But now you have. Uh, yes, yes, Dr. Pema, your video, please. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, okay. 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 Uh, can you see me now? and also hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you very much, and I'm very sorry. Uh, I tried my computer this morning, maybe I tried it too hard. So the sound system was not working. Anyway, now I'm supposed to give you the welcome address on behalf of Visimoth, but uh, now I will cut in between and give my remarks. So uh, first of all, I'm very delighted to welcome you all to this uh, session, which is hosted by ECMO, and to listen to my colleagues on our experiences and the concerns that we would like to share with the global community. As you know, ECMO is a intergovernmental knowledge and learning center serving eight member countries. And they are Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. Uh, as a charter member of the Global Landscape Forum, we feel privileged to have this opportunity to participate in this digital conference to share not just our experiences, but also more importantly, the challenges and the opportunities that we have in front of us in terms of landscape protection and biodiversity conservation. ISIMOD is committed to improve the well being of men, women, and children in the Hindu Kush Himalayas through three strategic areas of impact. One, reducing poverty. Two, enhancing resilience by reducing physical and social vulnerabilities. And three, enhancing ecosystem services. Our work focuses on mountain peoples and their physical and natural environments, along with upstream and downstream connections in the HKH region. Ladies and gentlemen, the HKH, as you know, is a unique region of the world that requires global attention, particularly due to the impacts of climate change, which is much more pronounced here than perhaps anywhere else. You have heard my colleague, Dr. Eklavia Sharma, already highlighting the vulnerability of the Hindu Kush Himalayan region. What is unique? The HKH is a region with incredible biodiversity and spectacular natural beauty. It is home to mountainous areas of two of the world's mega diverse countries, China and India, as well as to four global biodiversity hotspots. The HKH region, 
The HKH region also has a wealth of cultural diversity with at least 1,000 spoken languages or dialects. The associated tradition, traditional and indigenous knowledge and processes that are still practiced today makes our region a bioculturally very rich region. Yet the region is faced with many challenges in the forms of poverty and ecological instability as a result of rapid population growth, urbanization, migration, economic development, and of course, climate change. It is therefore needless for me to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has further compounded these challenges. Hence, it has become even more imperative for us, the global community, to pursue a conservation and development trajectory that follows the path of resilience and sustainability in the mountains. As one of the major programs, as one of our major program focuses on biodiversity and ecosystem services, ECMOT is implementing the town's boundary landscape program in four north-south transects across the Hindu Kush Himalaya that was already shared by Dr. Eglabia Sharma. We are also implementing the Red Plus Himalayan program in partnership with our member countries. Therefore, during this session, my colleagues and representatives from our member countries will share about our work in the HKH, the challenges and opportunities for biodiversity conservation and our experiences during the pandemic that will help shape our work towards a resilient recovery. I am proud to mention that we have an excellent lineup of speakers and panel members from across the, across the region. In conclusion, I would like to reiterate, reiterate that ECMOD is committed to be an active member of the Global Landscape Forum. Thank you and trust Delhi. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pema. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Dr. Pema. Uh, now we would like to move on to the panel discussion. Uh, for that, I would like to hand over to Dr. Janita Gurung, who will moderate the panel discussion. Dr. Gurung coordinates one of four transboundary landscape program at ISI mode, the Kailash Secret Landscape Initiative. Over to you, Dr. Gurung. Thank you, Benai. Um, it is my privilege to moderate this panel discussion with our speakers from across the Hindu Kush Himalaya today. On the panel, we have with us Dr. Mejibin Abidi Habib from Pakistan, Dr. Sarala Khaling from India, Dr. Fu Yao from China, Mr. Sunam Tashilama from Nepal, and Ms. Jamyang Dolka from Bhutan. I welcome you all. Our panelists will share the diverse experiences of working in a bioculturally rich region. We have also received from uh, some questions on the Q&A box. And I would like to, to uh, tell our participants that some of the answers will be given in the questions that I'm going to uh, pose to the panel speakers today. Uh, to begin with, I'd like to start with Dr. Mejibin Abidi Habib. Dr. Mejibin is an ecologist and a writer with extensive experience in social ecological adaptation and resilience. She is one of the founding members of the Karakoram Research Institute that focuses on social ecological change in the HKH region. Dr. Majibin, my question to, to you today is, can you highlight one case from the mountains of Pakistan where indigenous traditional knowledge has been key to conserving biodiversity? And from this example, could you list the three key conditions that were crucial to achieving this? Over to you, Dr. Majibin. Thank you, Dr. Gurung. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to take you to a remote uh, mountain valley called Shimshal in the Karakuram Mountains of Pakistan, which is a pastoralist society rich in biodiversity and glaciers. Here, the traditional ecological knowledge is held in oral traditions. And this biocultural knowledge meets conservation science in, for example, the Ibex trophy hunt that has helped regenerate biodiversity in the region. After the hunt of the, the ibex, a story is told by Shimshalis in which the roles are reversed. The ibex relates the hunt to its young, 
a story of loss, of prayers for safety for the Ibex community. So here we see the values that this community of humans upholds, principled around identifying nature with human belonging and reverence. This in our region is called compassion and empathy. The three conditions that are essential uh, are that nature and humans hold a unified worldview of land, water, history, identity, all woven together. For example, as shown in the Ibex hunt story where roles are reversed. Secondly, traditional common property management regimes should prevail so that local communities are organized either in traditional or new local institutions as exemplified in village organizations that arise from development efforts all over the HKH region. The third is how conservation science and its executing institutions must meet biocultural knowledge in negotiations of rules and produce procedures and not in domination. For example, recent research shows that the dominance of the English language in forestry has hidden many meanings and management regimes of forests in practice all over Europe, which were not fully appreciated up to now. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Major Bean, for this really extraordinary learning from the Western Himalaya. And now I'd like to turn to the Eastern Himalaya and address my question to Dr. Sarala Khaling. Uh, Dr. Saral Sarala is the Regional Director of ATRI Eastern Himalaya in India. She is an interdisciplinary researcher from India with extensive experience in managing landscape programs. She is currently working on food sovereignty, sustainable food systems, and the water energy food nexus. Dr. Sarala, my question to you again is, can you share with us a learning from the Eastern Himalaya and again, share the three conditions that were crucial to achieving this, um, this, this work in biodiversity conservation. Over to you, Dr. Sarala. Thank you, Dr. Guru. And a very good afternoon to everyone listening to this uh, program today. And uh, thank you to EC Mode for giving us this opportunity to interact with this global audience on very important issues uh, which are critical, especially today. Uh, as Dr. Sharma has already presented, uh, Eastern Himalaya again is within the HKH and it's very rich in biodiversity and natural resources. And one thing is obvious that development planners, industries and businesses are looking towards this region to boost economic growth and especially after COVID. And like all mountainous regions, there are environmental and development problems and challenges in the region. At the same time, one cannot uh, turn away from the aspirational changes, especially among the younger generation to benefit from the economic growth that is seen all across the world. Nonetheless, what I want to say is that the rich biodiversity, the pristine forests, functioning ecosystems and diverse ecosystem services remain only and only because the local community's way of life, their dependence on nature, nature-based solutions, their rich traditions and culture, their spiritualism and values that are based on nature. At the same time, I do not want to romanticize that all is well in these mountains, but there are definitely a few stories that inspire me and I think they are worth mentioning here. I would like to talk to you about a state in Arunachal Pradesh, one of the northeasternmost states in India, where the Adi indigenous people live, and they are known to be great hunters traditionally. But in recent years, what has become is hunting has become commercial from a subsistence kind of a hunting. And at the same time, they also have their own traditional institution, which make customary laws that are adhered to even now by their community. So in this situation where hunting had become commercial from subsistence, 
the Adi institution came together to urge their community first members to give up hunting. As a result, what has happened is many villages have adopted this, and these have been led by the headmen of villages. And even now, there are people who tell us that many people are giving up this commercial hunting and even limiting their subsistence hunting. The other example I want, I cannot help but give is about Nagaland, where community leaders, local organizations, scientific communities, government and citizens came together to conserve a migratory bird, the Amur falcon, which migrates across India and there is a stopover in Nagaland. Every day about 12,000 to 14,000 falcons were killed. But now these birds are conserved and the villages where they were hunted, they welcome tourists who visit to watch the same migrating falcons which earlier were killed by the same community. The third example I want to give is of Zongyu Valley in India's smallest Himalayan state, Sikkim. Few progressive farmers are actively involved in preserving their traditional crops, which have mostly been replaced by very high yielding hybrid varieties. Although there, are, there is no economic incentives, they are motivated to conserve these heirlooms that they inherited, inherited from their ancestors. And some of the, I would think there are many conditions why these are happening. These success stories of traditional conservation stories are happening. And there are many interlinkages between these conditions, but three critical conditions I would like to highlight here are number one, institutions, presence of a leading traditional institution that spearheaded these biodiversity movements, conservation movements, which involved communities that had immense traditional knowledge. The other one is there was a win-win situation, situation where biodiversity conservation happened because of global and national outcry, for example, in Nagaland. But communities were self-motivated to change this, and there was an alternative for them, for example, tourism in Nagaland. The third thing I think is very important is the sense of a place in these biocultural landscape, filled with rich traditions and cultures, and they still bind communities to the heritage. And therefore, even though the majority are going with the flow, of unsustainable development, there are these beacons of conservation from a few knowledge holders, and these can have a very good, you know, mo this can be a very good motivation for all the others. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Dr. Sarala. And actually, thank you also for these very motivational learnings from the Eastern Himalaya. Now, continuing with this uh, topic of traditional systems that we've been discussing. I'd like to direct the next question to Dr. Fu Yao. Dr. Fu Yao is an ethnobotanist at the Kunming Institute of Botany in China. She studies the relationship between local people and their biodiversity. Her interest lies in traditional knowledge related to local biodiversity and healthcare. Dr. Yao, my question to you is that traditional healthcare systems are very easily overshadowed by modern practices. Given this context, can we retain the best of both systems, particularly in a fast-changing socio-economic societal context? Over to you, Dr. Yao. Yes, thank you, Janita. I think this is a very interesting question, really. The question started with a statement, traditional healthcare system are very easily overshadowed by modern medicine. Uh, for me, I think, at local level, it's a stereotype. If we look at the World Health Organization statistic uh, in developing country, more than 70% of population are rely on traditional medicine for their healthcare. And our own research experience also tell us many people in local area still rely on the traditional healthcare system in their daily life. For example, in this small grocery shop, they are selling many herbal medicine. And, uh, but if we look at policy and public domain, I think it's very much true. Traditional healthcare system were overshadowed by modern medicine. If we look at the 
government budget, the business investment, and even by counting the published journal articles. And, but I have to say maybe um, most of us will agree, agree both systems are important for our health. So if we look at in many developing country, local people can only rely on traditional healthcare system is because the lacking of access of modern medical facilities. And in more developed world, more and more people are getting interested in traditional medicine because they started to use a more holistic and preventive view to see, to understand health. And many chronic and age-related disease are difficult to treat by current modern medicine. So can we retain best of both system? Here, I would like to give a positive answer by giving a recent example happened in COVID period in China. Actually, after the COVID happened in China, the health um, department set uh, emphasis on traditional Chinese medicine together with Western medicine to treat this disease. And uh, there's one traditional Chinese medicine, a uh, herbal decoction showed very good clinical effects and it has been widely used until now it has still used. And after this, many research were carried out to investigate the mechanism behind this herbal decoction by using modern or advanced pharmaceutical approach. So I think this case showed a very good opportunity to return the best of the both system. But we were aware uh, the policy will or the policy support is very important to initiate this combination both of a uh, uh, system and uh, sound research, like the research. On one hand, they care about traditional knowledge. The other hand, they will use the modern technology is a good way to combine both of the system. So this is my short answer for your question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao, for your very interesting uh, learning from China. And now I want to shift gears a little bit and direct the next question to the role of youth in biodiversity conservation. Here, I am happy to introduce our fourth panel speaker, Mr. Sunam Tashilama. Sunam was born and raised in the mountains of Nepal, and he is one of the founding members of the Red Panda Network. In 2015, he was named the Disney Conservation Hero for his work on conserving this endangered species. Sonam, as a young conservationist who works extensively in the field, what are the major threats to biodiversity in the mountains and how can youth play a significant role in addressing these threats? Over to you, Sonam. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gorung, for, for the intro and the questions. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Isimo for giving us a uh, red panda net with this uh, platform to be a uh, to, to be a part of this uh, important discussion, and I will I will be answering your questions based on the view of wildlife conservation, a regional, regional point of view uh, that would be uh, concerning the landscape. I think the loss of the habitat creating bottlenecks uh, that caused the absence of wildlife corridor and connectivity, and habitat degradation due to the overgrazing. Uh, and over ex exploitation of forest resources are the major challenges that are ha ha hampering conservation of wildlife in our region. Uh, similarly, forest con conversion to agricultural fields, uh, loss of springs and water resources, uh, over exploitation and unsustainable extraction of commercially viable species, human con wildlife conflict are some of the other existing uh, challenges that directly affect the conservation of wildlife and biodiversity in our region. Uh, the adoption of the unsustainable development practices like 
uh, building rural roads and trekking trails inside the core wildlife habitat without any impact assessment are degrading the habitat very negatively. Uh, there is a need to think about the development uh, of green infrastructures in place of unsustainable structures that are in practice in, in, in the area. As Dr. Sarma mentioned in his panel, uh, uh, in his keynote speech that the uh, Hinduku Himalaya has is a home to 240 million people and and the and the and the majority of the uh, majority of the population there are youth uh, and and the youth has a main responsibility to halt this kind of uh, challenges because uh, the youth has a responsibility responsibility to a responsibility to save the sustainable future of our generation alpha or the people to be born entirely in the 21st century. And current recession by the COVID-19 have had a major impact on the on this generation. So this has caused the historically high level of unemployment among the youth pe young people. So so to to balance this one, uh, we have a choice to be involved in the in the conservation of biodiversity. Yes, Dr. Sarma also mentioned that the, there are new species being discovered every year, around 35 species being discovered in this region. So we have a very uh, hot biodiverse area. So you and every youth of my generation can be the, can be the next people to explore another, another new species for this region. So I would like to, um, I would like to call for the actions for every youth of this region for a wildlife and biodiversity conservation. Thank you. Thank you, Sonam. And I would like to actually continue this discussion on youth. And for this, I am happy to introduce our fifth panel speaker, Ms. Jamyang Dolkar, who is an associate lecturer in Shirutse College, Royal University of Bhutan. Her research interests lie in the area of environmental policy and law, gender studies, biodiversity conservation, and water resource management. Ms. Jamyang, as another young environmentalist who shapes young minds through the field of academia, can we link indigenous and traditional knowledge systems to well-being and Bhutan's gross national happiness? And again, how can youth play a role in this process? particularly in this area of globalization and modernization. Over to you, Ms. Jamyang. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Jen Janita, for the question. Um, I'll, start the, I'll start this uh, question by answering what GNH is. Um, GNH is the developmental philosophy of Bhutan. So it gives equal importance to non-economic aspects of well-being. So traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge, as we know, they have played a very important role in conservation of environment, even before the sciences of conservation was developed. It provided food security and it is vital for communities' identity. Now, along with the customer practices that we have in Bhutan, other ways that traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are practiced in Bhutan are, we have number one, the uh, tra traditional medicine hospitals in Bhutan. So this traditional me medicine hospital is based on Buddhist text, which is embedded in Buddhist culture and traditions. We still practice uh, the collection of the wild edible plant in many communities in our country. Um, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are also taught um, in educational institutes, for example, uh, in farming methods in their communities. So the marketing of products that are developed on traditional knowledge and into being explored. For example, we recently uh, launched product in Bhutan based on Zingiber Kasamunar, which is a mountain ginger. Now, this product was de developed based on the community's knowledge. So it, it was the community um, who directly benefited out of the, the launch out of marketing this product. So it led to youth employment, uh, encouraged women's participation and enhanced uh, livelihood. So parts, uh, you know, practicing and preserving traditional knowledge 
knowledge and indigenous knowledge, therefore goes on and upholds the four major pillars of GNH, which are it helps in preservation of culture, um, it contributes to conservation of environment, uh, marketing and bioprospecting, it also helps uh, attend the sustainable development, social, social and economic goals, um, engaging and involving communities in planning, decision making and management of this knowledge helps uh, uphold the good governance pillar. So that's the link between uh, TK, IK and the um, GNH. Um, on the second question about to how can you participate because youth are the future. It is very important that uh, for TK and IK to be alive that there is discontinuation or transfer of knowledge. Um, so the first and foremost thing which I feel important is to create awareness and help dev youth develop interest in traditional knowledge and uh, indigenous knowledge. So traditionally, the TK and IK have relied on oral transmission, that was the mode of transmission. But the challenge with this mode of transmission is that um, there, there is a chance of losing this knowledge or there's a the chance of dilution of this knowledge. So documentation of this knowledge, uh, I feel is very important to preserve. Secondly, um, since traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge are very much associated with uh, culture, uh, festivals, rituals, and other practices in communities, I feel that you should be more involved in their, uh, more involved in festivals and then rituals and practices that are prevalent or that are practiced in the communities. Um, thirdly, I also feel that um, local community practices such as um, collection of wild edible plants or foraging for uh, other food items, um, these are the practices that needs to be continued um, because this would help uh, youths be more involved in collection, in identification and in retaining the knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Jamyang. And I must say that many of the questions that have been raised in the Q&A box are probably answered by all of our panel speakers. Uh, there have been a lot of questions on documenting uh, knowledge, traditional knowledge, uh, human wildlife conflict, the trade-offs between biodiversity and development. And uh, I think uh, some of the answers can also be added to the Q&A box in Hoover. Uh, but before, I'd, I'd like to actually ask one round of final questions to our panel speakers. Uh, this is, uh, I'd like to ask all of them turn by turn. Uh, please could you state one priority action in order to protect the pulse? May I start with Dr. Major Bean, please? Thank you. Um, so if, if there was one, I would say uh, it is based on water in the Himalayan in the Kush region. This region is called the third pole because it, um, it has the largest stores of ice outside the um, North and South Poles, and one third uh, of the world's population depends on stored water. And really including the biocultural management of water in the Third Pole allows or will allow for a healthy coexistence of people in nature. In this connection, the um, age gauge call call for action is quite a comprehensive plan that we should keep our eyes and ears attending to, to um, action as it unfolds from there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mejibin. Water, the basis for life. Uh, now may I direct this question to Dr. Sarala Khaling, please. One priority action to protect the pulse. Over to you, Dr. Sarala. Uh, Dr. Sarada, please unmute yourself. I think uh, the call to protect the pulse is so appropriate today as we are in such unprecedented times. And this is mainly because of our own actions. And I think yesterday in the opening session of this uh, GLF digital conference, there was this discussion on halting land use alteration and change that leads to land degradation. I think that's one of the most important actions
actions that we can, I can think of today. Uh, so in the mountains, we need to halt this land use change slash alteration, which is leading to land degradation. And this will mean that we have to change the way pl we plan our policies and implementation for agriculture, for linear infrastructure, other infrastructure, the urban planning that we do. And it also has to change about how we treat our rivers, wetlands, rangelands, and even forests. And like many of the speakers uh, in this panel, and especially the young speakers, I think young people are our hope to bring about these changes. And we see around the world that there are young people who are leading movements to stop harming the planet further. And I think we need to engage with them, strengthen them, and especially communicate with them in the language that they understand to bring about these changes in their lands and therefore across the you know, Hindu Kush Himalaya region. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Dr. Sarala. Stop harming the planet. Uh, Dr. Yao, may I ask you the same question, please? One priority action in order to protect the pulse. Over to you, Dr. Yao. Yes, thank you. I think in this panel already, we mentioned a lot about traditional knowledge. So for my last word, I still want to stress traditional knowledge. For me, really like traditional knowledge in relation to healthcare and biodiversity conservation, it really can play a vital role in protecting our past. And I think to do that, we have to document the traditional knowledge in a systematic and critical way by using interdisciplinary approach. And then let the sound knowledge transformed to policy making process and also the public domain and make the knowledge become sound action. It's not only for our human, but also for other species in our world. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Document traditional knowledge for policy and action. Uh, now may I direct this question to Sonam. Sonam, one priority action to protect the pulse. Over to you, Sonam. Sonam, you have to unmute yourself, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Guru, for, for your question. Uh, I think uh, to protect the pulse, we need to protect uh, our rest or our biodiversity. Uh, I think that that's why we need to focus on the restoration of the uh, degraded lands. As we are going to start the land, uh, UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration, uh, 2021 to 2030. And uh, we also have a bond challenge to to plant trees by 2030, 350 million hectares by 2030. So that would be the one uh, priority action uh, to protect the pulse. And for this one, we need to empower the local community to be a, to be steward for the landscape because uh, they are the real stewards of their own land and they can nurture their, the health of their uh, uh, land. So I think uh, the restoration of the degraded land should be the one priority action for the next decade. Thank you, Dr. Guru. Thank you, Sonam. Uh, restoration of biodiversity with local communities. And my final question to Ms. Jamyang, one priority action to protect the pulse, please. Over to you, Ms. Jamyang. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I feel that we need to develop and build uh, and strengthen our scientific capacity, like research and then uh, research tools. Um, I think this is needed to help us adapt and mitigate against climate change and other global uh, drivers. Um, the Hindu Kush uh, Himalaya region uh, need to uh, continue collaboration and then build network, share data and train researchers so that we can come up with long-term sustainable solution to environment and conservation issues in the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Jamyang. Strengthening our scientific capacity in the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Uh, with this, I would like to thank all of our panel speakers and I hand this over to Binay. Over to you, Binay. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Gurung and distinguished panelists for the insightful discussion. For those who visited our digital exhibition booth, you know that we offered a giveaway of our 
award-winning coffee table book, Kailash Yatra. A total of 15 person participated in the quiz and three people have answered all the questions correctly. You will uh, receive the coffee table book. In addition, first two participants who answered four out of five questions correctly will also receive the book. Uh, we have posted the correct answers in the chat box. Please uh, have a look at the chat box. The winners of this giveaway are Lasata Josi, Alexandra Parsinska, Philip Chambers, Kama Sa Dorothy Azimi, and Prashant Sarma. Congratulations to all the winners. We will contact you for details to receive your coffee table book. We do hope that you'll enjoy this gift. And thank you all for visiting our exhibition booth. Now I would like to call upon Dr. Nakul Chetri, Regional Program Manager for the Transboundary uh, Landscapes Program here at ISIMOD to summarize the key takeaway message from our session. Over to you, Dr. Nakul. Thank you, Binaya. Uh, respected delegates, experts, panelists, Director General and Deputy Director General of ISIMOD, participants. I'm sure the session was uh, well organized and clear messages coming from the panels, as well as remarks and keynote presentations. It may be difficult to recapitulate the rich discussion, but I tried to say the essence as uh, here are some key messages. About, yeah, uh, Starting from yesterday, when you know this global landscape forum events were happening, some very interesting you know, figure came out, and it was mentioned that about five percent of the global population are indigenous, and these five percent indigenous people are conserving eighty percent of the biodiversity. So, which is very very astonishing. Uh, and today also we came to know that 70% of rural people still rely on traditional medicine. So hence, uh, this was possible due to biocultural approach used with rich and inherited indigenous knowledge and traditional system. Biocultural approach has been catering uh, historically the essential needs and food shelter, food shelter medicine since millennia, making it a sustainable approach. However, the paradox uh, is such biocultural rich areas are poorest in the region uh, and Hindukus is not uh, separate for that. Uh, so the biggest challenge is balancing conservation and development. I think these are the essence that are coming uh, from the discussion. And also though rich in biodiversity in the East Case region, the added challenges are from threats to biodiversity losing the remnants of wilderness, of climate change induced natural calamities, the role of youth and the role of youth and revival traditional knowledge has been insisted as an action uh, forward. Inclusive and balanced approach is needed, uh, value for both nature and culture, a better understanding through sound knowledge system, institutional development and policy supports are critical as it has been, you know, uh, mentioned during the discussion. The need of the hour is strengthening relationship between biodiversity, culture, and health at scale, recognizing the water tower, halting depleting biodiversity in the HKH, uh, preserving traditional knowledge, scientific capacity, and collaboration to be empowered, and also recognizing the role of local communities uh, in uh, conservation of biodiversity and traditional system. The need of the the need of the uh, hour is also to look at the scale, the scale at local, national, regional, as well as global levels, considering both traditional and contemporary knowledge linking science, policy, and practices. And uh, we uh, have to go. Uh, we have to have a good understanding about the HKS now, as we have uh, sorry, uh, as we have already a very good understanding of different aspect of HKS uh, at uh, now. So it is high time to act, and the note of the HKS call to action is very timely. So with uh, with this, these are the essence that I could uh, capture from the rich discussion. Thank you very much. Over to you, Binaya. Thank you very much, Dr. Naku. Now, before closing the session, we will put two more questions on Slido. Please visit the Slido. Our first question is, why do you think bicultural diversity matters? Write in one or two words, 
the most. The question is, why do you think the biodiversity, uh, sorry, bicultural diversity matters? Well, we have got quite a number of answers, but it would be nice if you could answer them in one or two words. We have got quite fantastic answers, balancing ecosystem, resilience of, for the environment and people, maintaining different socio-ecological systems across the landscape. Thank you all for your answers. It's uh, uh, very fantastic answers because it is the soul of the HKH, very nice one there. So now the next question is, how did you like our session? Our last question is, how did you like our session? We have multiple choices here. You may choose more than one options. While we have the results coming in, I would also request all our participants to fill out our result the link, uh, sorry, our survey, the link to the survey is shared in the chat box. So most of our participants uh, say, let's protect the pearls of the planet. Yes, let's protect the pearls of the planet. We have other participants saying motivational and inspiring. That's very encouraging. Thank you very much. Yeah, we are very happy to know that this session has raised interest about the HKH. Thank you, thank you all. Now, uh, if you have any further questions, you can always reach out and write to us through our email address, which is info at isimode.org, and we promise to get back to you at the soon. Lastly, I would like to give a big thank you to our distinguished speakers and colleagues uh, who are here today, and also all the participants who have joined us in this session. It would not have been, have been possible uh, without your support. Uh, with all that, I would like to move on to close the uh, take care, stay safe, and let's protect the pulse. Goodbye.